All right, let's begin. Uh, welcome to CS uh, 4510. It's, this is probably one of my favorite lectures. Uh, L10B. The topic of today is diagonalization. Diagonalization is the most important proof technique in this class. It's like a pumping lemma. Like you learn contradiction, you learn contrapositive, you learn direct, whatever. You learn some really trivial induction, pigeonhole, whatever. Then you learn like pumping very specific combinatorial arguments on, on things. Diagonalization is an incredibly powerful, diverse uh, proof technique. It's also historically very important. And more historically, it's controversial. It is. Um, I mean, well, well, I'll present the diagonalization proof technique, and then perhaps you should have some, some important questions about it. But I think this is the most important proof technique in the history of mathematics ever. It's my favorite proof technique. It's very general. It'll, in some sense, be the last proof technique we'll talk about. Um, it's incredible. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love this proof technique. Um, today, we're simply going to do it. it. It appears in many contexts, uh, but it starts here. It starts with a theorem about cardinalities of infinite sets. So we begin. Uh, with observance of the things we did last time. We took some, we took the natural numbers, we played with it a little bit, we took Cartesian products, we took unions and, inter and not intersections, we took unions and we added constantly many elements and we were able to show, well, we, we still had countably infinite number of sets. So we had, for example, like if you took infinity and you add three to it, it's kind of like that's still infinity, right? And then if you take two times infinity, that's like still infinity. And then if you take infinity and you cube it, that was like still infinity. We didn't really change anything. So as if you could be, if, if infinity was a number, it's not. But if it was, polynomially sized operations appear to still give you infinitely many elements. Like two times infinity is infinity. That makes sense. Infinity cubed is infinity. That's I was just the Cartesian product. That kind of makes sense. So the next question, of course, you should have is like, is two to the infinity equal to infinity? The answer is actually no, surprisingly. That's, that's the first historical controversy. We're going to prove something today that um, it's called Cantor's theorem. It says that there does not exist a bijection from a set to uh, its power set. The cardinality of the power set of any set is strictly greater than that of the set itself. There does not exist a bijection uh, from any set A to the power set of A. Um, the, this is like, well, you know, OK, whatever. Um, but this is for any set A. This is including for infinite sets A. So if A is an infinite set, the power set of A is also an infinite set. But in some sense, what this says is that this is a bigger infinite than the other infinite. So what that really means is there's multiple infinities. There's at least two infinities, and that they are different. And one infinity is bigger than the other. Um, <coughs> this is basically what we're going to spend today on uh, for Cantor's theorem. First, we'll prove it in special cases. We'll elucidate the proof technique, and then we'll do it in, in the general sense. Uh, let's do the easy case. Case A is finite. Why is that? True, why does that work? So the power set has like at least one set for every element of A and also the empty set. Uh, that's too hard. If A is finite, how many elements are in the power set of A? Two times Yeah, if the cardinality of A is equal to n, then the cardinality of the power set of A is equal to 2 to the n. So for all n in the naturals, it is true that 2 to the n is greater than n, QED. Right, you're talking about a bijection. First off, um, there's always an injection from a set to its power set. What is the injection? From the element to the set containing the element. Yeah, so there's always an injection from a set to its power set. That's not controversial. Uh, the injection is simply you take x, uh, and then you map it to the set containing x, the singleton set. Right? Certainly, there's a bijection to the, to the unit sets, the singleton sets. Um, so we do see that there's an injection. But by saying there's no bijection and that there is always an injection, what we're really saying is there no, is no surjection. 
This is why we interpret this theorem to mean that there's a second infinity, because this certainly can be bijected to a subset of the unit sets, but because it, there is no bijection, there's also no surge, this can't ever be a surjection. So there must exist elements in the power set which cannot be mapped to for all possible functions you can consider mapping from the set to the power set. So in some sense, there's more of it. There's infinitely many more subsets than there are sets. It's, that's why we interpret this to mean a bigger infinity. Right? Questions so far on the statement? I'm going to do the diagonalization proof technique. I'm going to do it very slowly, and we're going to go through it uh, step one step at a time. We'll do it for the special case that A is countably infinite. Um, uh, we'll, do the, we'll do the proof that the cardinality of A, of N, is strictly greater than and not equal to the cardinality of the power set of the naturals. So we'll do it for the special case of the naturals first. We'll observe the diagonalization to proof technique. We'll generalize it. How do we prove it? Such a proof that there does not exist a bijection, of course, can only be done one way, which is by assumption to the contrary. Assume to the contrary. Uh, there exists a bijection from a set of the naturals to the power set of the naturals, right? Assume to the contrary there exists a bijection from the naturals to the power set of the naturals. Uh, then uh, the elements of the power set of the naturals uh, can be ordered like S0, S1, S2, uh, totally. So if a set is, it's what we're saying, assume to the contrary, the power set of the naturals is countably infinite. If a set is countably infinite, you can list it in an order. The order is total. Every element appears in the order exactly once, at most once, and at least once. So every element of the power set of the naturals, every subset of the naturals exists in this ordering, S0, S1, S2. Okay. You could put them in a line. Consider uh, the set D such that uh, I is in D if and only if I is not in SI. And that equivalently, I is not in D if and only if I is in SI. I is just a set of numbers. We just define it to go to the ith set. You look at the ith number. If it has it, then don't put it in there. If it's not there, I'll put it in there. D I, D is just, a, is just a set of numbers, okay? Certainly D contains numbers, right? So D is an element of the power set of the naturals. Agree? If D is an element of the power set of the naturals, it must have been put in line. So there exists J uh, such that a D is equal to SJ. Uh, the definition of equality of two sets is that two sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements. So there is a J such that D equals SJ. D is equal to this SJ. D is this SJ, in fact. By what we mean by there exists a J is we mean that D is in the Jth place in line. It's the 10th spot in line. It's the 15th spot in line. It's the 120th spot in line. It's in line. If D is a subset of the naturals, it has to be in line somewhere. Okay? Is J, J is the spot in line it is, J is also a number. So two sets are equal if and only if they have the same numbers, if they have the same elements. So we know then that J is an element of D if and only if uh, J is an element of SJ by definition of set equality. Again, two sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements. So if J is an element of D, that's true if J is an element of SJ because D is SJ. But by the definition of the construction of D, we know that J is an element of D if and only if we went to J SI and we observed that J was not an element of SJ. By properties of the if and only if, we can say that J is an element of SJ if and only if J is not an element of SJ. Contradiction. Uh, no element may be in and not in. 
a set. Another way to look at this last statement is that j is not an element of sj means not j in j, sj. So we have some proposition if and only if the negation of that proposition, right? Impossible. The reason I'm presenting diagonalization this way is that it is a very tricky proof technique in the sense that on a first observation, you're like, there's no way that's possible. You, that, you, that shouldn't be allowed. Um, but there's nothing really circular going on here. I haven't made any specific proof mistakes. There are sometimes proofs people do like, you know, uh, you see fake proofs all the time, the same way you see free energy machines being invented, right? You see all oh, the square root of 2 is a, is a rational number. Somebody online the other day, I saw they, they gave a, a, a closed form uh, in radicals for the quintic roots of a polynomial, even though we know such a thing can't exist, stuff like this. So you, it's obvious sometimes proofs can be incorrect by like a trick of the light in the wording or something. But, and many people, when such a technique like this was invented, thought this had to be the case. There's no way this is science. Yet it is correct. I mean, what did we really reach the contradiction here from? Okay? The contradiction, again, purely logical. We didn't observe something radical. We simply observed that a, contra a pure contradiction occurred. An element was both in and not in a set at the same time, which is not, not possible. But nothing circular happened here. D is simply a set, and you can do this. You can say, choose the elements of D in such a way that they're not the elements of SI for each I. You go to each set. Basically what happens here, and the reason this is called diagonalization, is because I and SI are like the diagonal entries of a matrix. You consider IJ as a coordinate. II is the diagonal. You go to II and you look at the opposite. Right? You go to each set, you ask it one question, and then you make sure you do the opposite so you're not that set. D does not do anything useful. It is the diagonal element. It simply exists to disagree with all sets, and therefore I am none of them. That's the whole point of D. Are there any questions on this proof? Do we understand it? Are we convinced that the power set of the naturals therefore cannot be put in correspondence with the naturals? Again, observe that the contradiction we observed, uh, observed from the fact that we could put the sets in order. D being an element must therefore be in line. But because D was defined to be different than all of those, it can't be in line. Contradiction. Very powerful proof technique, right? Any questions on this one? We're going to do this proof like five more times today. It's a very incredible technique. Uh, let's do this. Consider the set of infinitely long binary sequences, uh, let's call it x0, uh, x1, uh, x2, such that x, x0 is equal to like 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, something like this, each infinitely long. So a string is terminating. We may say a string terminates. Every string has a length. A uh, sequence not necessarily terminates. So consider the set of sequence, consider the set of binary sequences. Perhaps some terminate and perhaps some don't. Uh, uh, the set of all binary sequences is uncountable. A set is said to be uncountable if it's not countable. So a set A, I don't know, we'll call it, whatever the set is, we'll call it A. A set is said to be uncountable if it cannot be put in correspondence with the naturals. Right? In fact, there is a bijection from the naturals to sequences, binary numbers, those are the terminating ones. But allowed here are arbitrarily long uh, sequences, right? In fact, we may suppose that we only allow arbitrarily long sequences. And we still have an injection. But I claim that the set of binary sequences is uncountable. There are more binary sequences than there are uh, natural numbers. Infinitely meaning more, in fact. It's a higher infinity. There are more sequences than there are numbers. Uh, proof, assume to the contrary. Uh, the set of binary sequences is countably infinite. We'll say even countable, because it's certainly infinite. You can create infinitely many sequences. So then the sequences, so then the sequences may be enumerated 
uh, like uh, x0, x1, x2, such that each sequence uh, appears in this ordering exactly once. Every binary sequence appears in the ordering once and only once. No sequence is missed. Uh, no sequence appears twice. Uh, consider the sequence uh, D, uh, such that uh, for all i, uh, D of i is defined to be 1 minus the ith sequence's ith bit. And we use this notation in brackets to be like an infinitely long array or something. The ith digit of the ith sequence, perhaps each. So for example, uh, if x0 is this, then x0 of 3, 0, 1, 2, excuse me, x0 of 2 would be 1, for example, right? You go to the ith digit of the ith sequence, and then you do 1 minus that bit, right? Uh, well, d is a sequence, is a binary sequence. So there exists some j such that d is equal to xj. And we may define a quality of binary sequences to be such that if all their digits are identical and the same, right? If the d is equivalent to this xj sequence, then we know that d of j is equal to xj. xj of j, excuse me. But by definition, We know that d of j, uh, d at index j, is defined to be 1 minus xj of j. So if d of j is equal to xj of j, and d of j is also equal to 1 minus xj of j, we know that xj of j is equal to 1 minus xj of j. That implies... Uh, that 1 is equal to 2 times xj of j. There's a contradiction here. What is it? It's not even. 1 is not even. If you observe, the proof is identical, in fact. We proved, we s performed what's called a diagonalization. Here we diagonalize over subsets of, this, of the natural numbers. Here we diagonalize over uh, binary sequences of, arbitrary, of infinite length. Not arbitrary length, but infinite length. The set of binary sequences uh, is uncountable. There are more sequences than there are numbers. In some sense, this should perhaps not be so surprising because if we consider the definition of bijection to be a correspondence, you can in fact put... Uh, the power set of the naturals in correspondence with, we'll call it A again, I guess, the uh, set of binary sequences, right? Can you give me a, uh, bijec such a bijection between an, a, a, a binary sequence and a subset of the naturals? Take a subset and, like... At, like it maps to the binary sequence where the i thing is a zero if and only if that element is not contained in the subset. Like if that number is not, like i is not contained in the yeah. subset. Yeah. Uh, the, the, you can define the characteristic sequence of a set. So consider some set S in the power set of the naturals. Uh, and then you consider some, some function f of S is equal to some x such that xi is equal to 1 uh, if... Uh, I is an element of S and zero otherwise. So what that means is the empty set, for example, would correspond to the sequence zero zero zero. Uh, the sequence of evens would correspond to like one zero one zero one zero, right? The set of the naturals itself would correspond to one 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 one, right? So you can per perform a bijection. In fact, what is a subset if not a selection of the elements? Each integer sequence, excuse me, each binary sequence exactly in, uh, characterizes a subset of the naturals by which elements are in and which elements are not in. That's exactly what the information contained in the set. So you may bijection between the two. In fact, we did the same proof. These are the same proof. We just proved it 
uh, in a different notation. When we chose d here to have a, the ith digit be different than the ith sequence's ith digit, well, what we did was the same as if we went to the ith set and asked if it contained the element i or not. If it did or it didn't, then we make sure we do the opposite. Recall if x, each bit is a 0 or 1, 1 minus xi i is just flipping the bit, right? This is, this, this is in fact, the same proof. Questions on this one? We've proved it for the countably infinite case. We began with, uh, we proved that, we proved it for the case that um, A is a finite set, and we said obviously by 2 to the n it's finite. We also proved it for the case that A is a countably infinite set, a set that can be put in correspondence with the naturals. Uh, we have not proved it in general. We now know that there exists infinitely many sets, but we want to prove that in general for any set it cannot be put in correspondence with the naturals. Oh, sorry, one more quick comment on why it's called diagonalization. Actually, I'll do two more things before we, before we get to that point. Uh, if we were to put the, uh, the, uh, the sequences like this, so we put i, uh, we put, we put uh, 0, 1, 2 here, and we'll put x0, x1, x2 here, if we were to put these sequences uh, as rows, and the columns represent the ith bit of the ith sequence, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, right? Something like this. If you consider that you put the sequences like this, the diagonal d, di, uh, being defined to be 1 minus xi, of i, the ith sequence the ith bit is this diagonal. This is 0, 0. This is 1, 1. This is 2, 2, right? So when you perform a diagonal, diagonalization, implicitly there is, exists a table of a 2 by 2, uh, uh, a, a, a table, a two dimensional table that associates the elements on the diagonal such that d is the opposite of each element on the, on the, on the diagonal. Um, so, for example, d here would be 0, 0, 0, 1. Although you should perform diagonalization logically like this, you can think of it like a little game. You can think of it as the fact like, OK, well, assume to the contrary there exists a j. You put it in the jth row. Ah, but by definition, it disagrees with it on the jth spot. Well, maybe you put it at the fifth spot, but it'll disagree on the fifth row, and so on, right? So in fact, what this says is that if you could draw such a table, you would not be able to put the row d in any row, because d is defined explicitly to be different than every row. So there does not exist a row. This is where the name diagonalization comes from. It comes from the diagonal. When you do a diagonalization proof, you should not draw such a table. The table is implicit. Please don't draw a table. Diagonalization occurs in many diverse forms. Often, the table only exists when you're diagonalizing over a countably infinite set. But you can diagonalize over some crazy things. It's an incredibly generic and powerful technique, and we'll do two more examples today of this. Uh, let's do uh, another proof of the reals. You may have seen this one. Let's even do the positive reals. Great. Positive reals are uh, uncountable. In some sense, what this means is that the naturals, of course, cannot be put in correspondence with the reals. but there, there are, but since every natural is real, it means that there are more reals than there are naturals. A set being countable intuitively means like you can go from one to the next. We did so with difficulty when we did the positive rational numbers because we do this weird anti-diagonal argument. But at least we can still do it. We can still put the rationals in correspondence. By proving the real numbers to be uncountable, what, what this means is that we can't, uh, we can't ever count the real numbers in some sense. Like, at some real number, you want to go to a next real number, it's impossible. The two infinities can be thought of as if the naturals have a sort of discrete kind of infinity and the reals have a kind of liquid, continuous kind of infinity. In some sense, although the naturals are infinite, there is always a next natural, inductively so. The reals cannot be defined in this way. It's like water versus an infinite bucket of marbles or something like this, right? Uh, anyway, let's proceed. We prove 
Assume, uh, assume to the contrary. Uh, there exists a bijection uh, f, which corresponds the naturals to the reals. Uh, then the uh, reals may be ordered like R0, R1, R2, each are written in its infinite uh, decimal expansion. Each real number has an infinite decimal expansion, right? So for example, we can take like pi, you can do like 3.14, 1, 5, whatever. We can do 0 0.1111. We could do, I don't know, uh, 0, 0.000. We can do 137.0101, da, 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 right? Define the real number a d to be uh, 0 uh, point d1, d2, uh, decimally such that di uh, does not equal ri's uh, ith digit. So if, for example, we would take the ith digit and maybe we added 1 to it or something, right? There's a small bug here, if you, if you notice. What we, there's a, a, a problem with associating the real numbers this way with their infinite decimal expansions. Do we know? Again, not a super serious question, just a Vsauce trivia question. Some of them are duplicates. Yeah. Did you guys know that 0 0.99 is equal to 1? Why? Well, uh, here's two proofs of this. One, uh, this is 3 times 1 third. That's equal to 1, right? But also 1 third is equal to 0 0.333, right? Uh, that's one proof of it. Uh, there's a second proof of it. Uh, what is 1 minus 0 0.99? Yeah, 0 0.01. Oh, no, that would mean they're different. It's 0 0.00. 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000. Uh, if the difference of two numbers is 0, then they must be equal, right? So if at any point you stop counting 9s, then you actually have a number distinctly not 1. But if the nines are arbitrary, not arbitrary, infinite, then it is actually just one. So you have to add a small sentence here, which is that you say ri's, uh, and then you say no digit of uh, di is 0, a 1, or even 9. Let's just say it's actually just sufficient to have 1 or 9, but I'm going to ignore 0 anyway. It's fine, right? You just change to make sure you add each digit, except the other ones. You just, there's always, it's always, each digit is always one symbol. Just make sure it's some other symbol, okay? Um, since uh, we have this bijection f from the naturals to r, uh, there exists a j such that f of j is equal to r, excuse me, d. Since d is a real number between 0 and 1, it's a real number. Every real number has a decimal expansion, and every decimal expansion corresponds to some real number. So there exists a j in the natural number such that d equals fj, right? But uh, so then d is equal to rj. Uh, so the jth digit of rj is equal to the jth digit of dj. Just dj. Of j, of d. Yes, thank you. But by definition, uh, the jth digit of d is exactly not the jth 
digit of uh, RJ contradiction. So we see that the reals are therefore uncountable. Right? Probably a more classic version of this proof. Questions on this one? Comments? Thoughts? There is uh, the history behind this is even though we call it Cantor's theorem and we prove it for the case of the power set, Cantor explicitly was searching for a proof of that uh, certain numbers were not algebraic. A number is said to be algebraic if it's the root of a polynomial with integer coefficients. For example, x squared minus 1 has square root of 2 as its root. So we would say that square root of 2 is an algebraic number. So you consider all possible polynomials with integer coefficients, and you consider their roots. It's really diverse things that go on, right? Oh, sorry. you gotta, you got to tell me when that happened. You can't just smile. OK, so uh, one also similarly is algebraic. So he was concerned with the number of algebraics there. Are. Uh, and it was a really difficult. Someone had proved earlier, uh, Louisville had proved like pi and e are not algebraic. I think it was e, actually. So e, pi came much later, but e is not the root of a, actually, did it? 1770s? I don't remember. We know today that pi and e are not algebraic. What that means is they are not the root of any polynomial with integer coefficients. You cannot describe a polynomial with integer coefficients that has pi or e as its root. In some sense, that makes it transcendental. It's different than um, uh, square root of 2. Although square root of 2 is irrational, it's algebraic. So Cantor comes up with this really complicated proof. And in fact, he shows, in some sense, most real numbers are not algebraic. The algebraic numbers, I'll leave it to you as a proof, are countable because the set of polynomials with integer coefficients are countable. You can probably typewriter principle that up, maybe get rid of the duplicates a little bit. You could fix that. Um, so the set of algebraic numbers is countable. He does such an argument, perhaps with worse notation, and he proves that the set of real numbers is uncountable. In some sense, most numbers are not algebraic. Most real numbers are themselves uncountable. We get one more corollary of this. An algebraic, a number being algebraic in some sense is a name for the number, right? Uh, here's a corollary. I don't know how to spell corollary. Most numbers are unnamed. Uh, proof, uh, the set of names is a subset of sigma star and is therefore countable. So, all, uh, excuse me, not so, but uh, the real numbers are uncountable. So, uh, so there must exist some R and R uh, without a name. What does this mean? What, is the, what, is a, what does it mean for a number to be named in general? Uh, if you start talking about a number, you describe the number with human language. You've started putting some strings on the paper. You've named the number, and you've added it to the set of numbers that have names. Yet for, I claim for any way you could do this, you cannot eventually name every number. Some number, in, some number will always remain unnamed, right? Basically by diagonalization. In fact, you could diagonalize over the set of names and give a... I define a number r to be that which is not previously named plus 1. But now you've given it a name, right? Kind of tricky. Even with such an argument, uh, there are so many more real numbers than there are names for the real numbers that assert, no matter wh who does this, some number is always going to remain unnamed, right? Questions on that? In some sense, the reals don't pass a version of the fathomability criterion we gave. You can't really compute on a number's arbitrary decimal extent, expansion. Every automata we've defined computes on a terminating string, so in order to accept or reject. But you can't really compute on an arbitrary real number, right? Question? For the unnamed numbers, since we have a naming convention we applied, can't you just like kind of 
step by step infer that all of them are named by that convention? Is a name only if you important to the to that corollary is the fact that a name is a terminating string. If you assume the name of a number, I mean, uh, uh, he who has an infinitely long name, I would say is unnamed. Hello, my name is, uh, 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 right, um, yeah, so it's unnamed, right? Okay. Questions so far? I'm going to do two more diagonalization proofs for you, just to show you the diversity in uh, the technique. I'll also say that every homework from here on out is going to have a diagonalization question on it. And the next homework might only be diagonalization questions. I'll decide. Um, if A and B are finite sets, do you know how many functions there are from uh, A to B? Does anyone know this off the top of their head? Set of total functions from A to B, combinatorics. Is that true? Maybe it's the other way. I thought it was the other way. Does anyone confer? The number of total functions from a finite set to a finite set is what? Oh, that's b to the a. Because like, for, each, for each a, you have to pick a b. OK. Um, that looks like 2 to the n. So in fact, we'll prove the set of total functions from the naturals to the naturals is uncountable. Such a proof could put a subset of them in correspondence with the power set of the naturals. Uh, but of course, you have to appreciate the elegance that is diagonalization. And so you should approach a question with diagonalization. How are we going to do this? Assume to the contrary. Uh, such a set is countably infinite. Then the functions may be ordered like uh, f0, f1, f2. Consider a g, uh, where g is a function from the naturals to the naturals, such that uh, g of n is equal to the, f, the nth function evaluated at n plus 1. Uh, since g is a function that evaluates naturals to naturals, uh, there exists a j such that uh, g is equal to fj. Do we recall the definition of a quality of two functions? Two functions are equal if they evaluate to the same elements, right? Not if they look the same or have the same domain or image or codomain or whatever, but they have to map the same elements to the same elements. That's the definition of a quality of functions. Like the definition of a quality of sets is they contain the same elements, not that they have the same name. Um, uh, so if g equals fj, uh, then uh, g of j is equal to fj of j. But by definition, a g of j is equal to fj of j plus 1. So uh, fj of j plus 1 is equal to fj of j. Contradiction. Remember, fj of j is just some number in the naturals. There does not exist n such that n is equal to n plus 1 by definition. We didn't set up a table, importantly, here. We didn't put bits into a two-dimensional matrix and then take the diagonal. The diagonalization, again, the table is implicit. And you want the proof to handle that for you like a program handles assembly. You don't want to write a table each time. Why is this, again, a diagonalization proof? We went to the nth function evaluated at an n. That's like the i, i diagonal. That's the same thing. And then we added a 1 to make sure we're different than the diagonal. We could have added 10.
Could we multiply by 2? No, because 0 times 2 is 0. So if in case f of 0 is 0, it's not going to work for that one time. So we add 1 to it. Right? Here we've proven the set of functions, total functions, is uncountable. And sometimes there's might, you could think there's more functions than there are subsets, but that's not true. Because in fact, you can put them in correspondence. With, with some difficulty, you could put them in correspondence. Any questions on this proof? Again, uh, it's about the technique. It's about the, uh, the villainous exposition. It's about the drama. It has to set up and flow and follow a certain way. Right? We've only done proofs of diagonalizations, basically, of countable sets. Let's do, finally, let's prove the last corollary of Cantor's theorem. And then we'll talk about cardinal numbers for a minute. Uh, for any set A, uh, it uh, there does not exist a bijection from A to the power set of A. Right. We have proved it in the countably infinite case and, of course, the finite case. We're now going to prove it in the case that A itself is uncountable. Before, when we proved the countably infinite, we could diagonalize by taking the ith element and the ith row, but that was by assumption of countability. Here, we can't even assume that A itself is countable. Suppose A is the power set of the naturals. So we were proving there is no bijection between the power set of the naturals and the power set of the power set of the naturals, the set of all subsets of the set of all subsets of the naturals, right? And some, this will have some great uh, expository power. Um, how do we prove this? Of course, assume to the contrary. Um, there does exist a bijection uh, from A to the power set of A. Consider the, the set D containing elements of A such that X does not map to a set containing X. Let's take a second to observe this notation. We are taking a set, uh, we are considering a subset of A. We are, ma we are considering the elements to be in A, those which are not mapped by, a by the function, whatever this bijection is, X is not mapped to a set that also contains X. So whatever elements are not mapped to themselves, not necessary to themselves, but not mapped to a set containing itself, that are, those are the elements that are in D. Okay? Since D is obviously a subset of A, that implies that D is an element of the power set of A, right? And if D is an element of the power set of A, then there exists a J uh, such that uh, the, the bijection maps the element J to this set D. D is a subset of A. D is an element of the power set of A. The bijection maps some element of A, perhaps a set of subsets of subsets or whatever, but some element uh, of A to D, because D is an element of the power set of A, right? Is D an element, uh, does J, the element of A, is it contained in D, the subset of A? Well, if Fj is equal to D, we know that J is an element of D if and only if J is an element of F of J, by definition of a quality of sets. But by definition of D, uh, J is an element of D if and only if J is an element that is not mapped to this to a set containing J, right? 
contradiction. So we see Cantor's theorem to be true even in the case that A is uncountable. Questions on that? There is no way to put the table up in this one, but again, the contradiction flows logically. A diagonal is uh, an object that exists for no reason except to be disagreeable. It stands there and says, I'm not like any of you, and therefore it can't be contained in the collection of elements that contains only those items. If D is different than every one of these sets, then it's not in the collection of those sets, right? By definition. Here we get an interesting corollary. We know that the naturals, uh, the cardinality of the naturals is strictly less than the cardinality of the power set of the naturals. But we just proved the general form of Cantor's theorem. So we actually know that the power set of the power set of naturals has cardinality strictly greater than that of the cardinality of the power set of the naturals. But this itself is infinite because you can find a bijection, excuse me, an injection from the naturals into the power set of the power set of the naturals. So there's at least infinitely many of them, at, but not at most. In fact, there's two levels of infinity more. Let's do one more for drama. We'll do the power set of the power set of the power set of the natural numbers is a set of subsets, is the set of all subsets of the set of all subsets of the set of all subsets of the, of the natural numbers. This is strictly greater cardinality-wise than the set of all subsets of the set of all subsets of the naturals, right? Immediately we run into uh, an interesting analog. There's infinitely many infinities. It, how many infinities are there at least? Many. There's at least countably infinite infinities. Uh, that's too many to worry about. So what we do is we denote this one by a fancy number that's in Hebrew. I can't ever draw this letter. We call that Aleph Null. Man, OK. Aleph Null is like this N, but it's wiggly. Uh, that's the cardinal. We say that the, we, we define the cardinal numbers to be such that Aleph Null, OK, Aleph Null is equal to the cardinality of the naturals. And then we define uh, Aleph I plus 1 to be the cardinality of 2 to Aleph 0, excuse me, I. Where 2 to the I is the cardinality of the power set of a set of cardinality Aleph I, right? So the power set of the naturals we would say is cardinality Aleph 1. The power set of the power set of the naturals, we would say, has cardinality A of 2, and so on. So there's subsets which have numbers. And then if a set is infinite, it may itself have a cardinality, which is one of the countably many infinite infinities. Uh, the next question you should have, of course, OK, now there's countably many, at least countably many infinite infinities. How many more infinities are there? Uh, weeds are a tough question. So. Um, cardinal, these are called cardinal numbers, and they have similar properties to that of numbers, uh, but not really. Each one itself is not a real, it's not a number. I mean, it's a thing. Um, there's a statement called the continuum hypothesis. The continuum hypothesis is no longer a hypothesis. I want to state that out loud because when I was learning this, I assumed it was an unsolved question because it was called the continuum hypothesis. It is solved. Uh, but perhaps in a negative, in a negative answer. The continuum hypothesis says that there does not exist a set C such that the cardinality of C is strictly between the cardinalities of the naturals and the power set of the naturals. Let's take a moment to observe what the implications of... Uh, oh. Let's take a moment to observe the implications of this statement. There does not exist a set C such the cardinality of C is strictly that between the naturals and the power set of the naturals. If the continuum hypothesis was false and there did exist such set C, then that would mean between every two infinite sets there exists another infinite set. And perhaps that would allow you to perform a density argument on the cardinal numbers, like we did for the rational numbers, right? Between any two infinities, there's... <coughs> There's an infinite that's, not, uh, that's neither of them. Um, and for a very long time, this was an open question. And today, I, people still think it's an open question, surprisingly, but they don't simply know the logic. This was basically resolved in 1973, in, in 1963, uh, in a very unsatisfying way. Um, 
and I forget the order exactly, but Gödel in like the 40s, and we'll talk about Gödel's work later, he proved uh, you can't disprove it. Uh, the continuum hypothesis. So he proved that you can't disprove it. Uh, a guy named Cohen in, I think, 1963, 1961, he proved uh, you can't prove it. Okay? So we have a statement. There does not exist a proof of CH, and we, you can prove there does not exist a proof of CH, ironically. You have a statement CH, and you can prove that you cannot disprove CH. So you have a statement which does not have a proof. There is neither a proof of the statement nor a proof of its negation. In some sense, this is unsatisfying. It is still called the hypothesis because it has not been affirmed in the positive or the negative. But in, for all intents and purposes, it is resolved. I mean, it's, you can't say it's true. But we would call, to continue my hypothesis, we would say it's independent. There does not exist a proof or a proof of its negation. If you were to assume the statement to be true or perhaps false, the only consequence you would observe is whatever you can deduce from that statement as an assumption. You know, if you assume it to be true, you don't get anything interesting out. You just get the fact that some sets exist with this property. If you assume it to be, to be false, you also don't get any statements that are interesting out of that property. You just get like normal cardinal math and set theory. So. All right, any questions? All right.